Hi there, my name is Amy Lushke and I'm with you today to give a short recap of our last webinar called The Inbreeding and Hybrid Vigor, The Genetic Effects That Boost the Success of Procross. And you can view the full length version of this webinar on the Procross YouTube channel. So let's get going on today's material. So before I get going exactly on the topic today, I first want to recap a little bit about Procross. Procross is a breeding program where three breeds of sires are rotated on crossbred cows. If you haven't seen my first webinar, Procross the Basics, I suggest starting with that content to learn more about our company and the ideas behind Procross. Procross creates big opportunities for commercial milk production because it joins the effects of using three robustly selected breeds that have a complementary set of strengths, and it also maximizes hybrid vigor. More on this hybrid vigor part later in today's talk. Procross is typically implemented on a Holstein herd and can start with either Viking Red or Montbelliard uh, to initiate the rotation. Then these, this two breed cross is bred to the third breed, in this case, Montbelliard in this diagram, before returning to Holstein. And then that rotation continues on indefinitely. So for today's topic, first I wanna define a couple terms for you that I'm gonna be using frequently. Inbreeding depression. Uh, there's a lot of technical definitions for this, but a very simple way to think about inbreeding depression is that it's a reduction in fitness or a function caused by breeding individuals that are related. So in this uh, photo I have presented here, I show that inbreeding depression reduces litter size in golden retrievers. And that's a common phenomena for all animal species is that inbreeding will reduce the number of uh, animals within litters for dogs and pigs and other animals with multiples. Um, it also reduces a lot of other traits uh, for specific things in dairy cattle, which I'll talk about in a minute. The other term that's important to get out of the way here in the, in the first part is hybrid vigor. Hybrid vigor, or sometimes called heterosis, depending on which country you're in, we'll, we'll use one term or the other most commonly. And hybrid vigor can be thought of as the improved or increased function of an offspring over the average of what the parents are producing. So in this photo here, I'm showing you two parents of uh, cherry tomatoes and each one produces a certain amount of fruit, but you can see when they're crossed in this hybrid offspring, the hybrid vigor comes out and we get roughly three times as much fruit from that offspring. So a little bit first about the inbreeding part of this, uh, this topic. An inbreeding coefficient is probably the most basic and commonly used way to characterize the degree of inbreeding. And the inbreeding can just be thought of the probability that both copies of the same gene is inherited from a common ancestor from both the sire and the dam side of the pedigree as they come together, okay? And so the, the probability part is really kind of uh, counts the number of genes that are coming down from both sides. Um, here I'm showing the inbreeding coefficient for US Holstein females. And in the US and also in Canada, we start with a very early pedigree base. The US starts in 1960, which is why we start with a zero inbreeding coefficient at that time. And the, the line here shows that we've increased um, fairly uh, linearly throughout time. However, we have two chunks of time that did have higher rates of inbreeding, um, both throughout the 90s and then especially in more recent years. So then the actual inbreeding coefficient for this time period in the U.S. is 8.62% for females born in 2020. Actually, if we look ahead into calves born in 2021, that inbreeding coefficient is 9.09%, so quite an increase in just one year. And in Canada, you'll find roughly the same uh, level. As I mentioned, inbreeding coefficient has climbed a lot just in the last 10 years or so. And you can see that from the pitch of this line here. Actually, Jersey has also increased at roughly the same amount in the same time period. And they're up to 8.44%. 
for 2020, 8.66% for 2021. Generally in the industry, we tend to think that this is due to uh, the shortening of generation interval brought on by genomic selection within these pure breeds. Now keep in mind that this, uh, this measure of inbreeding coefficient is only amongst the Holstein cows enrolled in milk recording. And that includes about 20% of the US dairy population. Now, the reason I bring this up is because this is a pretty select part of the, the dairy population. Um, these are the cows that are most likely to be using planned matings and most likely to be using inbreeding protection in their matings. So we can really expect the rest of the population to have higher levels of inbreeding coefficient than even this. Um, just for perspective on where this inbreeding coefficient lies, a first cousin mating, it results in an inbreeding coefficient of 6.25%. And that's generally thought of as the level in which you'll start to see these negative repercussions of inbreeding depression surface in the populations. And we're quite a ways above that already, two or 3% above that 6.25% level. Now you might think of a percentage trait like this of having a ceiling of 100%, but really that's not the case. Uh, a full sib mating is a 25% inbreeding coefficient, sire daughter mating is the same. And so really we're gonna max this thing out at some, some measure probably slightly above 25%, but once we get to that level, it could be quite dangerous for these populations. Um, so we don't really want to get up to that those types of levels. We want to keep this all within moderation. Now remember, inbreeding coefficients are a measure of risk. They're not a direct measure of the health of a cow. However, there's strong correlation here because research across the species point to strong relationships between health and fertility complications as these inbreeding levels rise. Let's talk about that a little bit more. There's a lot of research out there that uh, shows the economic penalty when these inbreeding depression levels get high. And for example, this study here I'm showing you on the top here, uh, for every 1% of increase in the Danish, Finnish, and Swedish populations, we see a deduction of about 24.8 euros uh, per 1% increase. And the levels are relatively similar amongst the two US studies that I list here. Most recently, $25 for every 1% increase in the US. So let's apply that to where we are today by just a couple of examples here. In the Nordic example, we can take that $24.80 that I showed you just on the left here per 1% increase and multiply that by 5.45 that's the average inbreeding level today of, uh, of the um, Nordic Holstein, the Viking Holstein. And when we multiply that out, we get a 135 euro lifetime penalty for cows due to inbreeding depression. If we divide that out by the numbers of days that the average Viking Holstein will stay in the herd, we see a daily penalty for inbreeding depression of about 14 cents per day. We can do the same thing with a US example. Now, the $25 per 1% increase is based on the fact that the US does show a higher level of inbreeding. However, keep in mind that this higher level is basically due to the depth of the pedigree and also a difference in the calculation method for the inbreeding. Uh, that's taken into account when the scientists uh, discovered and uh, and estimated this $25 per 1% increase. But even so, when we multiply that out, we're seeing in the US example, a $227 lifetime penalty for inbreeding. And that math across the lifespan of a US Holstein works out to 23 cents per day. Just for some context, if you've seen me talk in the past about the profit difference with Procross versus Holsteins, we estimate that Procross has 34 cents more daily profit than their Holstein herd mates. 
And that's without the advantage of uh, feed efficiency for Procross. So if we assume that, um, in fact, that inbreeding depression and hybrid vigor are equal in opposite effects, we would expect about half of that 34 cents to be due to inbreeding depression, the other half of that 34 cents to be due to hybrid vigor. Well, half of 34 cents is 17 cents per cow per day. And in fact, that 17 cents lines up pretty well with these estimates I'm presenting here uh, from the inbreeding depression in these other studies. So what is happening in more recent years? Well, here in this chart, I've broken out what has happened with inbreeding depression just in the last decade. And this inbreeding depression continues to climb, starting at a 12% increase, or sorry, 0.12 increase just from 2010 to 2012, but all the way up to about half a percent of increase just in the most recent three years. And yes, the generation interval has shortened even more as time goes on, but the increase in inbreeding has accelerated even more with time. And some geneticists will now ask, will our pace of inbreeding compromise the long-term genetic improvement of cattle? Because remember, as we increase inbreeding, we take genetic variation out of the population. And we might want some of that genetic variation for traits we discover in the future, where we don't have the best data recording to capture what's happening in those traits today. And uh, in fact, scientists are now concerned about inbreeding to the level um, that we are meeting on this topic just in three months through an ADSA Discover conference that's happening uh, here in the US. One other point I wanna make about this increase in inbreeding, how much is too much? Well, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, otherwise called FAO, they're in charge of monitoring and preserving genetic resources for the future of food production. So they advise on risk management of breeding programs. And their scientists have said that a rate of inbreeding above 1% per generation increases the risk that the population in the long run will not survive. So preferably they would prefer to see inbreeding below half a percent for long-term sustainability per generation. Well, based on this chart I'm showing you here, if we consider that the average generation interval is now three and a half years in the U.S. and slightly longer in some other countries, the average inbreeding increase per year should not exceed 0.29 per year ideally averaging about 0.14 for the US population. Okay, and we're well above that here in, in the last three years. If we want to achieve the half a percent per generation that the FAO recommends for long-term sustainability, the annual increase needs to be around 0.12. And that's currently the level that we're seeing for increase in Sweden and Denmark right now. Um, however, there's still concern there that that could ramp up into the future. So let's shift gears here and talk about why crossbreeding. Well, a couple of minutes ago, I mentioned that inbreeding depression and hybrid vigor are equal and opposite effects. We can accomplish both of these things through crossbreeding with distinctly different breeds. And that's because we limit the effects of inbreeding depression uh, with the crossing of pure breeds and we take advantage of the hybrid vigor from, uh, from using distinctly different breeds when they're crossed at the same time. Generally speaking, we see uh, hybrid vigor from crossbreeding ex expressed at these levels. However, realize that these estimates are now getting a little bit dated. Um, so they could be higher now if we uh, were trying to reestimate these on current populations. And in the full length recording of this webinar, I give examples with dairy cattle traits on how these percentages would be calculated. So check out that webinar if you're curious where, where these numbers come from. But just know that we expect a bigger response from the traits most related to health and function, that being the fertility, longevity, and cow health. Because these three are so important, it's no surprise then that hybrid vigor for profit is also major in dairy cattle. 
Now, I did talk in this lecture too about the percentage of maximum hybrid vigor we receive within rotational crossbreeding. Um, when we consider two breed versus three breed versus four breed rotation, these are the percentages by generation. And why is three breed the most ideal? Well, first of all, when we look at what happens in the second generation of the rotation, when you only cross two breeds and you go back to the parent breed in the second generation, we dip down to 50% already. And so that's a big uh, drawback for the two breed cross. They also have a lower level of hybrid vigor overall. In addition to this, we see uh, more hybrid vigor at stabilization for the three breed cross. Yes, we see even more when we move to a four breed, breed cross, but not nearly as much as moving from two breed to three breed. And a disadvantage of a four breed cross is that we also have to uh, inventory a fourth breed and we have to find a fourth breed that really fits the production system well. And a lot of dairy herds have a hard time doing this. Um, so for rotational crossbreeding compared to other types of crossbreeding, we also reviewed terminal crossbreeding and composite crosses. But the advantages for rotational crossbreeding is that they have the highest hybrid vigor, they have the highest uniformity when compatible breeds are selected, you get equal genetic influence of three pure breeds, and we have the opportunity to use the highest ranking and most progressive genetics within each of those breeds. When I reviewed terminal crossbreeding and composite crosses, we uh, described how they worked and we gave examples. But the reason we choose rotational crossbreeding is because it boils down to this idea of maximizing hybrid vigor combined with the opportunity to use the best bulls. And those facets are hard to achieve with both terminal crossbreeding and with a composite cross. So to finish up here today, we went through the main considerations for an optimal crossbreeding plan. In our earlier webinars, we covered these first two points, choosing distinct peer breeds with sizable populations and progressive genetic selection programs. And then in the second webinar, we talked about breeds that are complementary in strengths and weaknesses. Today's webinar covered using three breeds and using them in a rotation to maximize hybrid vigor. These things negate inbreeding depression, and so we get the maximum hybrid vigor for these traits that are so critical for profit. And then in a future webinar, we will cover this last idea I have here. Use only the highest ranking bulls in each breed, and we'll talk more about how to accomplish that. Thank you for listening to the short summary of our webinar, Inbreeding and Hybrid Vigor, Genetic Effects That Boost the Success of Procross. Again, you can find the full-length version of this live webinar on our YouTube channel at Procross. And if you have questions on this subject or other ideas around Procross, feel free to send me a personal email. Thank you very much for tuning in.